that this House disagrees with Lord's Amendment number one. This bill is vital to stopping the boats and preventing the dangerous, illegal and unnecessary journeys across the Channel. The bill, as passed by this House, made it unambiguously clear to illegal migrants and people smugglers alike that if you come to this country by unlawful means, you won't be able to stay. Instead, you'll be detained and swiftly removed, either to your home country or to a safe third country. The Government brought forward a number of amendments in the Lords to enhance the Bill. These are largely of a technical nature, so I won't detain the House by setting these out now, and instead will confine my remarks to the non-Government amendments passed by the other place. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am grateful to the House of Lords for undertaking its proper role as a revising chamber. Some of the changes made by the other place are, however, little short of wrecking amendments and not one that the Government can support. There are a few honourable exceptions, and I'll deal with those first, but I'll happily give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. As he says, most of the amendments we are going to be debating and voting on later today are wrecking amendments. Does he agree with me that none of these amendments address the fundamental need to address the actual incentives for people to cross the Channel? That's what the Bill does, and these amendments take that away. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is, is absolutely right, and I would direct members on either side of the House to the speech made in the other place by the noble Lord Clark in which he said very powerfully that, as a former Home Secretary and long-standing member of this House, interested and knowledgeable in this issue, he sat through many hours of debate and didn't hear from any of the critics of this bill a single credible alternative to the Government's approach. And if you follow that logic, you need to get behind the Government then and support it to deliver this approach. He, I, I will give one second. He also made the other point, which I agree with, that if we fail to tackle this issue, if we dismiss the concerns of members of the public, then we will see very serious consequences in the years ahead in terms of a fragmentation of community cohesion and a weakening of the successful multi-ethnic democracy that all of us on all sides of this House are proud of and want to see sustained for future generations. I will give way to the Honourable Lady as she asked first. I thank the Minister for giving way. The Minister says that the, in the other place has put forward reckon amendments. Is it not true that the other place has really put through amendments that ensure that we honour treaties and we respect our judiciary and we ensure that the Home Office is acting within the law? I don't agree with that. There are a few uh, important exceptions, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment. So I hope that in the remarks that I set out and in answering any, uh, any question, I'll come to the, the, the Honourable Lady, uh, I'll be able to reassure her that on the points of substance made by those who want to see this bill proceed and this, tackle be, this issue be tackled, that the Government is making the right changes to the legislation. I'll happily give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful to him for giving way. He says that no one has proposed a credible alternative, but there are three amendments, three Lords' amendments, which do. Amendment 102, a duty to establish safe and legal routes. Yeah. Lords' Amendment 103, um, uh, which would amend Section 1 of the Crime and Courts Act to confer on the National Crime Agency specific functions of tackling cross-channel organised crime. And amendments 104 and 107, which would uh, mean that the government had to set up a 10-year strategy on refugees and human trafficking, working with foreign governments. Do these uh, three, uh, four amendments not constitute a credible alternative? I'm, as it happens, I'm going to come on to each of those points in my speech. So, if the honourable lady doesn't mind, I'll, I'll refer to those in a moment. But in each case. We are already doing what the Honourable Lady asks us to do. The Bill already has a specific provision with respect to safe and legal routes, and when we had this debate in this House previously, we agreed further uh, to set out the details of that. And With respect to the National Crime Agency, 
Well, the officers in that agency who work on organised immigration crime, who I've met in recent weeks in Belgium, in France, in Italy, in Tunisia and in Libya, will be very surprised to hear that the agency doesn't have the authority to act on organised immigration crime, because those, in some cases, very brave men and women are doing that work every single day on our behalf already. Let me make a small amount of progress and then I'll, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Uh, can I turn to the first issue of, of substance, which is Lord's Amendment 2, which provides that the duty to make arrangements for removal applied to persons who entered illegally from the date of commencement of Clause 2 rather than on or after the 7th of March 2023, as originally provided for in the Bill. We acknowledge the position advanced by some in the other place, and indeed in this House, about the retrospective effect of the Bill. But these Lords' amendments do go too far in resetting the clock. The closer we get to commencement of the Bill, the greater the risk that organised criminals and people smugglers will seek to exploit this and we will see an increase in crossings as the deadline looms, which only puts more people at risk. To, to guard against this, uh, I'll, I'll finish the point, then come to, uh, to other members. To guard against this, we brought forward amendments in lieu, which moves the application of the duty from the 7th of March to the date of royal assent. The 7th of March date would, however, continue to apply for the purpose of the Secretary of State's power to provide accommodation for unaccompanied children and for the purposes of the bans on re-entry, settlement and citizenship. This Government amendment in lieu has a particular advantage with respect to the concerns expressed by my right honourable friends from Maidenhead and Chingford with regard to modern slavery. But I'll come on to that in particular in a moment. I'll, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady, as she asked. I'm grateful to the Minister for, for, giving, for giving way. I wonder if you could uh, tell me how many um, Afghan women have been able to avail themselves of the ACRS Phase 3 programme. That is your, the government's position around a safe and legal route. And as we understand it from various debates that we have had in Westminster Hall, we're looking at a handful of phase in Phase 3. Everything else refers to what's happened in, in 2021. If I could draw his attention as well to the recent horrific drownings of Greece, where there were a number of Afga Afghan nationals who were included in, in those, but also in Pakistan-administered Kashmir, what really is the point of these ineffective, um, supposed safe routes? Well, the Honourable Lady and I share the same objective, which is to ensure that the schemes that the government has already established are operationalised as quickly as possible. And so those people who are eligible, uh, perhaps including the, the women that she is in contact with, can come to the United Kingdom, settle here and find sanctuary. It's incredibly important that the UK is a beacon in the world for resettlement schemes. We have already supported over 20,000 people under ARAP and ACRS to come to the United Kingdom. I appreciate the point that she makes, that the numbers in recent months have been lower than she or we would like. One of the reasons for that is because there is so little capacity today in the UK to properly house individuals. And one of the explanations for that, I, I, I will give way to Anglade, one of the explanations for that is that the sheer number of individuals entering the country illegally on small boats has placed an intolerable pressure on our social housing, on the contingency accommodation that we have available. And if we were to bring further individuals, which we want to and are continuing to do, to the UK, they risk being housed in hotels, which is an unacceptable way to house vulnerable people, and in particular families. I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. With his time, we have, um, in terms of the APBG for uh, Afghan women and girls, we have hundreds of uh, civilians who would like to have a Homes for Afghan scheme. They, these people are waiting and have already volunteered. This is a scheme ready and is equivalent to 
into the homes for Ukraine. So I really would urge the government to take us up on this and make sure that these supposed safe routes are actual safe routes. Well, I strongly endorse the comments that the Honourable Lady has made. The Homes for Ukraine scheme has been a superb one, which we should all be proud of. I took part in it myself at one point. If it's possible to create a comparable scheme for uh, Afghans, that's something that we should consider. And I know that my right hon. friend, the Leveling Up Secretary, who has responsibility for that, is considering that. Uh, with regard to the broader point about resettlement, the UK has a very strong record in this regard. Of course, we would all like to go further, but since 2015, we have welcomed 550,000 people to this country on humanitarian grounds, mostly on resettlement schemes, and we're one of the world's leading countries for those schemes. I'll give way, if I may, to uh, the right hon. gentleman, if he still wishes to. Well, while we're on the question of dates, uh, I would like to ask the Minister uh, if he has any idea as to when the Supreme Court may be considering and concluding its judgment, because it does have relevance not only to the question of the progress of the bill, but also in relation to the question of Parliament Act, in case it were to be needed. Well, it's a matter for the, the court itself to determine, in the first instance, if it intends to, uh, to take up the appeal and then at what time uh, it will be heard. I, I can only point, uh, my honourable friend, to the final paragraph in the summary judgment from the Court of Appeal, which expressed the view of the three judges at that point that this is a matter of great urgency and needs to be handled expeditiously. So I would hope that the Supreme Court, uh, if it chooses to hear our appeal, uh, does so swiftly. But, but that is a matter for the Supreme Court itself. Um, I'll give way to the Honourable and then I, I should make some progress. I'm very grateful to the Minister and he will know that I had a um, difficult approach to this bill from his perspective uh, at second reading. When he embarked on addressing Lord's Amendment 2, he did so by saying, and I address the first Lord's Amendment of substance, yet Lord's Amendment 1 deals with our international obligations. And I think we did have that curious start where this bill couldn't even have a full declaration on the front of it about compatibility with some of those international obligations. So I just say to the Minister, I think it would be incredibly helpful for him, and perhaps it was just a turn of phrase, to not only address Lord's Amendment 1 and the Government's approach to international legal obligations, but to outline... Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.